This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 6, Jesus, the Faithful High Priest, ready for teaching on February 5. It's from the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews, and is authored by Dr. Felix Cortez, who is the Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 29. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that not only did Jesus come and live and die and rise again, but that he is now our High Priest, as we read in our memory verse for this day. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide us as we continue to open the book of Hebrews. May in here we see not just the story, but may we see our need, may we see your grace and your kindness and the love that Jesus shows to us by being our High Priest. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Let's read that again. Hebrews 7 verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. The gulf that existed between God and us was caused by sin. The problem was compounded because sin also implied the corruption of our nature. God is holy, and sin cannot exist in his presence. So, our own corrupted nature separated us from God, just as two magnets in the wrong orientation repel each other. In addition, our corrupted nature made it impossible for human beings to obey God's law. Sin also involves misunderstanding. Human beings lost sight of the love and mercy of God and came to see Him as wrathful and demanding. This week, we're going to study the amazing things the Father and the Son did to bridge that gulf. Hebrews chapters 5 to 7 provides a careful analysis of Jesus' priesthood. The author analyzes its origins and purpose in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, and then exhorts readers not to disregard it in verses 11 through to chapter 6, verse 8, but rather to hold fast to the assurance of hope it provides through from verse 9 of chapter 6 to verse 20. He also explains the characteristics of Jesus' priesthood in chapter 7, verses 1 to 10, and its implications for God's relationships to believers in verses 11 to 28. This week, we will focus specifically on Hebrews 5, 1 to 10, and Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 28. Sunday, January 30. A priest on behalf of human beings. Read Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. What is the role of the priesthood? And according to this passage, how does Jesus fulfill that role? Hebrews 5, beginning at verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sin. And no man takes this honour to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And, having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. The basic purpose of the Levitical priesthood was to mediate between sinful people and God. Priests were appointed by God in order to minister in behalf of human beings. Therefore, they needed to be merciful and understanding of human weaknesses. In Hebrews 5, verses 5 to 10, which we've just read, Paul shows that Jesus perfectly fulfills these purposes. God appointed him, in verses 5 and 6, and Jesus understands us because he also has suffered, in verses 7 and 8. There are some important differences, however. Jesus was not chosen from among men, as we read in verse 1. Instead, Jesus adopted human nature in order, among other things, to serve as a priest in our behalf. Jesus did not offer sacrifices for his own sins, we read in verse 3, but also for our sins, because he was sinless, as we read in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, and also in Hebrews 7, verses 26 to 28. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected for ever. Hebrews says that Jesus prayed to him who was able to save him from death and was heard in Hebrews 5 verse 7. Hebrews was referring to the second death for which God saved Jesus when he resurrected him, as we read in Hebrews 13.20. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Hebrews also says that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered in Hebrews 5 verse 8. Obedience was new to Jesus, not because he was disobedient, but because he was God. As sovereign over the universe, Jesus did not obey anyone. Instead, everyone obeyed him. Jesus' sufferings and death on the cross are an essential part of his priestly ministry. Sufferings did not perfect Jesus in the sense that he improved morally or ethically. Sufferings did not make him merciful. To the contrary, Jesus came to this earth because he always was merciful, which is why he had compassion on us, as we've just read in Hebrews 2.17. What Hebrews means is that it was through sufferings that the reality of Jesus' brotherly love, the authenticity of his human nature, and the depth of his submission as representative of humanity to the will of the Father were truly expressed and revealed. He was perfected in the sense that his sufferings qualified him to be our high priest. It was his life of perfect obedience and then his death on the cross that constitute the sacrificial offering that Jesus presented before the Father as our priest. And so to finish today... Read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, which says that we are a royal priesthood. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. What does Jesus' life tell you that your relationship with other beings should be because we are in this sacred role?
Monday, January 31, according to the order of Melchizedek. Read Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 to 20, and Hebrews 7, 1 to 3. Who was Melchizedek, and how did he prefigure Jesus? Genesis 14, beginning at verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. And at Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Melchizedek was both a king and a priest. He also was superior to Abraham, since Abraham paid him tithe. Likewise, Jesus is king and priest, as we uh, read in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his majesty, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Unlike Melchizedek, however, Jesus was sinless, as we've just read in Hebrews 7, verses 26 to 28. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected for ever. Hebrews 7.15 explains that Jesus was priest in the likeness of Melchizedek. This is what the earlier expression in Hebrews, according to the order of Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 6 means. Jesus was not a successor of Melchizedek, but his priesthood was similar to his. For instance, Paul says that Melchizedek was without father, mother, genealogy, birth and death. Some have suggested that Melchizedek was an incarnation of Jesus in the time of Abraham. But this thought does not fit the argument of Hebrews. Melchizedek resembles Jesus, as one translation puts it in the ESV, which implies that he was different from Jesus, as we read in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. It also has been suggested that Melchizedek was a heavenly being, but this would destroy the argument of Hebrews. If Melchizedek were without father, mother, beginning or end, he would be God himself. This poses a problem. Melchizedek's heavenly, fully divine priesthood would have preceded the ministry of Jesus. If this were the case, as Hebrews says, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise in Hebrews 7 verse 11? Instead, Hebrews uses the silence of Scripture regarding Melchizedek's birth, death and genealogy to build a typology, a symbol for Jesus' priestly ministry and reveal that Jesus himself was eternal. In short, Melchizedek was a Canaanite high priest who served as a type of Christ.
Ellen White writes in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 409, It was Christ that spoke through Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God. Melchizedek was not Christ, but he was the voice of God in the world, the representative of the Father. And all through the generations of the past, Christ has spoken, Christ has led his people, and has been the light of the world. And so to finish today... What does the revelation about Melchizedek teach us about how God works among those who have never had human missionaries preach to them? Tuesday, February 1, An Effective Priest Hebrews 7.11 reads, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Priests are mediators between God and human beings. Hebrews says, however, that Levitical priests could not provide complete, confident access to God because they could not provide perfection. As you read in Hebrews 7.11, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? And the same chapter 7 and verses 18 and 19. For on the one hand there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope, through which we draw near to God. After all, they themselves weren't perfect, so how could they somehow bestow perfection upon others? Nor could the animal sacrifices cleanse the conscience of the sinner. Their purpose was to point forward to the ministry of Jesus and his sacrifice, which alone would provide true cleansing from sin, as we read in Hebrews 9 and verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And... Hebrews 10, verses 1 to 3. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sin every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And verses 10 to 14. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified." The function of the Levitical priests and their sacrifices was temporary and illustrative. Through their ministry, God wanted to lead the people to put their faith in the future ministry of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, as it says in John 1.29. Read Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. Why was there a need to change the law? Hebrews 7, beginning at verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, 
What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change in the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law as a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. Hebrews 7.12 explains that the change of priesthood made a change in the law necessary. Why? Because there was a very strict law that prohibited a person who was not of the line of Levi through Aaron from serving as a priest, as we read in Numbers 3.10, For you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. And Numbers 16, verses 39 and 40. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar, to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who was not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. Hebrews 7 verses 13 and 14 explains that Jesus was from the line of Judah, and so this law prohibited him from being a Levitical priest. So, Paul argues that the appointment of Jesus as priest meant God had changed the law of the priesthood. Jesus' coming also implied a change in the law of sacrifices. Sinners were required to bring different kind of sacrifices to obtain atonement. And we read all about that in Leviticus chapter 1 through to the end of chapter 7. But now that Jesus has come and offered a perfect sacrifice, the law of animal sacrifices also has been put aside, as we read in Hebrews ten seventeen to 18 Then he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin, as a result of the new covenant and the fuller revelation of the plan of salvation. And so to finish today. Think about the endless number of animal sacrifices offered through antiquity, all pointing to Jesus, and yet not one of them, or all of them, could truly pay for our sins. Why could only the death of Jesus pay for them? Wednesday, February 2. An Eternal Priest. Read Hebrews chapter 7, verse 16. On what basis did Jesus become priest? Hebrews 7, verse 16. Who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. Jesus received the priesthood on the basis of an indestructible life and because he holds an eternal ministry. The implication of these facts is astounding. It means that Jesus' ministry will never be surpassed or outclassed. Jesus saves completely, eternally, to the uttermost, as it says in Hebrews 7.25. The salvation that Jesus provides is total and final. It reaches the innermost aspects of human nature, as we read in Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And Hebrews 9 verse 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who, 
through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And Hebrews 10 verses 1 to 4. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Jesus' intercession before God involves all the benefits granted under the new covenant. It includes much more than the forgiveness of sins too. It implies putting the law in our hearts, making us new people in him, and leading us to the dissemination of the gospel to the world, as you read in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 to 12. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbour, none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins, and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. As one with God and with human beings, he represents us before the Father. As one who offered his life as a sacrifice, Jesus has unwavering favour before God. Read Hebrews chapter 7 verse 22. What is Jesus in relation to the new covenant? Hebrews 7 verse 22. By so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Jesus is the surety of the new covenant because God swore an oath that Jesus would be a priest forever, as you read in Hebrews 7.21. For they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. It is very easy to fail to understand the importance of this oath. Paul already had referred to the oaths God made to the desert generation and to Abraham. In Hebrews 3, 7-11, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation, and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And Hebrews six thirteen to 15 For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise." The difference between those oaths and the oath that God has sworn to the Son is that those oaths were made to mortal human beings. Oaths stay in force as long as the beneficiaries are alive. God's oaths to the desert generation and to Abraham were binding as long as there was a desert generation and there were descendants of Abraham, as we see in Galatians 3.29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In the case of the son, however, whose life is indestructible, the oath God made to him will be binding forever. A person who stood in surety or guarantee of another was liable to the same penalties as the person for whom he stood in surety, including death. Yet the Father established Jesus as a guarantee to us that he will not default on his promises. That's how certain we can be of the salvation that we have been given in Jesus.
Thursday, February 3, A Sinless Priest Read Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. What are the five characteristics of Jesus in this passage? Hebrews 7, verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Jesus was holy. This means that Jesus was without fault in relationship to God. Hebrews 2 verse 18 reads, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin, in Hebrews 5, verses 7 and 8, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered." The Old Greek translation of the Old Testament used the same Greek term to designate those who maintain their covenant relationship with God and with others. Jesus was undefiled. He remained pure and untouched by evil, despite being tempted in all points, as we've just read in Hebrews 4.15. And in Hebrews 2.18 we read, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus' perfect sinlessness is important for his priesthood. The Old Covenant stipulated that sacrificial victims had to be without blemish, to be acceptable to God, as we read in Leviticus 1 verses 3 and verse 10. Verse 3 reads, If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. And verse 10, If his offering is of the flocks, of the sheep or of the goats, as a burnt sacrifice, he shall bring a male without blemish. Jesus' perfect obedience during his earthly life made it possible for him to offer himself as an acceptable sacrifice to God, as we read in Hebrews 9.14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Jesus was separate from sinners when he ascended to heaven. The Greek verb tense suggests that this is a present state for Jesus, which began at a specific point in time. Jesus endured hostility from sinners during his earthly life, but he was victorious and then was seated at the right hand of God, as we read in Hebrews 12 verses 2 and 3, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Jesus also is separate from sinners in that he was perfectly sinless, as we previously read in Hebrews 4.15. Let's read that again. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was exalted above the heavens. It means that Jesus has been exalted above everything there is, and therefore he is one with God. In the Psalms, God is the one who is exalted above the heavens. As we read in Psalm 57, verse 5, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be above all the earth. And verse 11, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let your glory be above all the earth. And Psalm 108, verse 5. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth. Jesus was fully human, 
but he was not a sinful human being as we are, as you read in Hebrews two fourteen to 16 Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Jesus is perfect, not simply because he never sinned, but because he was not corrupted by sin as we are. Yet, because he also was fully human, he also is our example. He shows us how to run the race of life, as we read in Hebrews 12 verses 1 to 4. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God." For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. He is the example that we must follow, as we read in 1 Peter 2 verses 21 to 23. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Because he is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, as you read in Hebrews 7.26 in the ESV, he is our Saviour, and we too can reflect his character. And so to finish today, though Jesus was a human being like us, he never sinned. How do we wrap our minds around this amazing thought? Think about just how holy he must be. Why, then, should the promise of his holiness, being credited to us by faith, help assure us of salvation? Friday, February 4. In the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 931, which is actually a copy of Letter 90, written in 1906 by Ellen G. White, we read, Christ is watching. He knows all about our burdens, our dangers and our difficulties, and he fills his mouth with arguments in our behalf. He fits his intercessions to the needs of each soul, as he did in the case of Peter. Our advocate fills his mouth with arguments to teach his tried, tempted ones to brace against Satan's temptations. He interprets every movement of the enemy. He orders events. End of quote. And then, from The Desire of Ages, page 25 and 26, it was Satan's purpose to bring about an eternal separation between God and man. But, In Christ we become more closely united to him than if we had never fallen. In taking our nature, the Saviour has bound himself to humanity by a tie that is never to be broken. This is the pledge that God will fulfil. His word. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. God has adopted human nature in the person of his Son, and has carried the same into the highest heaven. It is the Son of Man who shares the throne of the universe. It is the Son of Man whose name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, as in Isaiah 9 verse 6. The I Am is the daysman between God and humanity, laying his hand upon both. He who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, is not ashamed to call us brethren. 
Hebrews 7.26 and Hebrews 2.11 refer to that. In Christ, the family of earth and the family of heaven are bound together. Christ glorified is our brother. Heaven is enshrined in humanity, and humanity is enfolded in the bosom of infinite love. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, the first quotation above says, He, that's Jesus, fills his mouth with arguments in our behalf. What does that promise mean to you? Think about what this teaches us about God's love for us. Why is this idea so encouraging? Why do we need someone arguing in our behalf? And question two. The second quotation above says that in Christ we become more closely united to God than if we had never fallen. What does that mean? How can we experience that closeness and what comfort can you draw from that experience? In class, describe what this closeness means and what it is like to experience it. How do his arguments in our behalf help us have this experience? Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Brave Missionary and it's by Daisy Jong. I always was a coward. When I first moved into an academy dormitory in South Korea, I had to listen to Christian music to fall asleep at night. When some unkind students robbed me of 10,000 South Korean won, that's about 10 US dollars in the bathroom at the train station, I was scared to enter the train station's bathroom again. My fears peaked when I served for a year as a student missionary in the rural Philippines. Young men, who were curious about me, a young foreign woman, gathered about my candlelit house at night, whistling and sometimes peering into the windows. I began to suffer insomnia and could fall asleep only at dawn after listening to Christian music and reading the Bible. My anxiety followed me to Southern Asia, where I now live with my husband and two sons. Many times my husband watched me carefully check my surroundings on buses or trains before closing my eyes to sleep. Daisy, he said, I'm really curious how a person as scared as you ever signed up to be a missionary. It was true. I was a coward missionary. I preferred to stay in safe places. But something changed my mind. One day, my sons and I were discussing war over a meal. I told the boys that many wars were going on around the world, and seven-year-old Saint, who has many fears like his mother, asked with interest, Mum, then we can't go to places like that as missionaries, right? Yes, we can't go to dangerous places, I said. Then does that mean that people there don't know Jesus? Saint asked. Yes, many people are dying without knowing Jesus. Saint said firmly, Mum, then let's go to those places. Let's go there and be missionaries. How could I object to such conviction? Let's do that some day, I agreed. Deep down in my heart, however, I had many questions. I wondered, I'm here as a missionary, but am I too worried about myself? I say I believe in God, but do I trust Him only when I feel that my own safety is secure? My daily prayers have changed since that conversation with my sons. Now I pray, God, please give me a mighty faith. Give me a heart and a faith to love people, to go near them, and to take care of them that is bigger than my fears about my safety. There's a photograph here of our missionary looking down the road. This mission story illustrates mission objective number one of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to revive the concept of worldwide mission and sacrifice for mission as a way of life involving not only pastors but every church member, young and old, in the joy of witnessing for Christ and making disciples. Learn more at IWillGo2020.org this lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. 
Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.